Good morning. Barry Bryson here. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the Word. We're in the book of Jude, and we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 23 today. So, Jude has thoroughly described um, the false teachers his readers are dealing with, and has forcefully uh, described the sure judgment that they are going to receive for being the kind of people they are, and for spreading the kind of false teaching they're spreading. In verses 17 through 23, he's talking directly to his readers about their own response to these guys. Um, now, yesterday, um, I didn't make any comment about the reference in the text to the love feasts in verse 12. So let me backtrack just a little bit and talk about that. What is the love feast, feast of love? It, in the first century, when churches, most churches were not that large, when people met in, hell, in homes, house churches, which was true for the church for the first two, three hundred years of existence, most congregations were small enough to meet in homes. Uh, just as happened uh, at the Last Supper, there was a communal meal that surrounded the uh, observance of the Lord's Supper. This is happening in Corinth. Paul, Paul makes that clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And they're turning the, the, this love feast around the uh, communion service into a drunken party, and an exclusive one at that. Well, that's what Jude's talking about. Jude's talking about this, this, this communal meal that was sacred that happened around the observance of the Lord's Supper. In fact, many first, second, third century churches, to, our, to the best of our knowledge, would observe the, the the Lord's Supper in this way. If you read the Gospels, Jesus takes the bread at the beginning of the meal and then takes the, the, the fruit of the vine, the wine, at the end of the meal. And so they would do just that. They would take the bread at the beginning of the meal and then have a simple meal and then take the wine at the end of the meal. And that would be their observance of the Lord's Supper. Uh, and it would also serve to, to feed some hungry people who were day laborers or maybe uh, didn't have enough, and, and they, they had this communal meal. We, we have communal meals, and, and we have pastries available at the end of the service uh, that serve the same purpose. This is not something that the New Testament has commanded, but it is certainly something that we know the early church practiced. And these guys are there ruining everything, and that's what he's talking about there. So I, I, I didn't want to leave you wondering what that reference was about. Verses 17 through 23, he's going to be talking to them about their, um, their response. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last times, there will be mockers following after their own lusts. We read nearly these same words in Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 3, um, and we read similar words in John, in Peter, and, and he seems to be calling to mind how they've been told by nearly all the New Testament writers that this is going to happen. They were saying to you in the last time there should be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourself in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. <clears throat> so, what they're supposed to do is remember, build and build themselves up. And he, and he tells them how, how to build themselves up, and there are three ways. One is, the way you build yourself up in faith is pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul's told us, this is not about achieving some ecstatic state before you pray. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 that when any of us pray, we're praying in the Holy Spirit because we don't know how to pray as we ought, that we have things inside us for which there are no words, but the Holy Spirit understands them, and the Holy Spirit delivers those messages uh, in our prayers to the Lord. And so praying, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God. John emphasizes this, 1 John chapters 3 and 4. We love God, we love each other. If you don't love each other, you don't love God. 
So pray and love and wait, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. The eschatological consciousness, the understanding that Jesus is coming soon, living as if this is our last day on this earth. That's how we deal with this. He didn't say, start a debate club and sharpen your skills of debate. That's not what he said to do. He said, pray, love, and wait. The, this is how you deal with these guys. It's not your job to judge them. Uh, they're already judged. It's not your job to punish them. God has punishment waiting for them. It's your job to ignore them, to not allow them to have influence and to make yourself strong. And how you do this is pray, love, and wait expectantly for the second coming. And then he talks about how you intervene in the lives of those who have um, succumbed to these false teachers. He says, um, have mercy on some, verse 22, who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. There are three levels here, and I'm not sure I understand the three levels, but there are three levels of intervention, and there are three levels of um, straying. Um, there are the folks who are on the fence, who are confused, who are doubting. They have to be loved back into the fold. You know, have mercy on them. Treat them mercifully. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. That seems to me like an intervention, the way we think of the phrase, an intervention, where you, you say to someone, I love you, but this is wrong, and you can't continue this way, and I'm here to bring you back to the fold. Um, and then the third, I'm not sure exactly what's being envisioned here, have mercy on some with fear. That fear, fear, fear of what? And, and maybe he means, you know, he's talking about a separation, that you love them, you have mercy on them, but you can't be part of their lives because of their toxic um, influence. You, you, have to, you have to, in a sense, not be afraid of them, but be afraid of the influence you would be exposing yourself or the weak to if you're around them. I don't know. But it, he makes it clear at the end of this verse that you do not hate this person. You hate the garment polluted by the flesh. You don't hate them. You hate you hate the trappings that they've put that they've worn. And we connect this with what Paul says in, in, in Galatians uh, 3, um, uh, 27, that we put on Christ in baptism. We wear Jesus like a garment. Well, they're wearing another kind of garment. They're wearing lies. They're wearing a garment of lies, and it's toxic. And you hate that garment, but you don't hate them. But because you hate the garment and because you love them and because you love others and you don't yourself want to be polluted, you have to quarantine yourself. You have to be afraid of their influence sometimes. And, and I think that's what he's saying. That's my take on it anyway. Okay, we're going to finish the text next time. Thank you for joining me for another five good minutes with the word.